I love competitive Pokemon, and I think more people should play it, but I understand going from a casual player who beats the champion and calls it a day, to dipping your toes in the competitive scene can feel different. Like, a lot different. With competitive Pokemon's focus on 4v4 double battles, something you almost never see just playing the story of the games, it almost feels like you're playing something completely different. Finding a familiar face would probably be welcome. Luckily, there's one thing that just doesn't change. You use Pokemon. Today, we're gonna go through Generation 1 and talk about each of these iconic, frankly, old Pokemon that have been used to competitive play. Full disclosure, this will be an overview of each Pokemon I thought was worth talking about, so don't get upset if I didn't mention the fringe strategy that got top 64 with Dugong in 2003. Table setting out of the way, let's get into it. I spent a lot of time talking about all the starter Pokemon in a recent video, so I won't go too wild here. Check out that video instead. But quickly, Charizard was great whenever Game Freak gave it a gimmick to take advantage of, like Mega Evolutions and Gigantamax, but otherwise, it's pretty mediocre. Venusaur is often a strong option on Sun Teams, thanks to its ability, Chlorophyll, and its access to Sleep Powder. Except for when it used its Mega Evolution, where it instead was kind of a defensive, bulky Pokemon with Leech Seed. Blastoise sure exists! Its Mega Evolution saw a little bit of play because of its high special attack and access to Water Spout, the strongest Water type move in the game. And its Gigantamax form was decent for a little bit in Sword and Shield, but that's really about it. Alright, with the repeats out of the way, we're gonna get a little more detailed from here. Butterfree saw real play for the first time in 2020. Now, Butterfree isn't known for its stellar stat points, but with enough unique attributes, almost any Pokemon can be strong in VGC. Butterfree's ability, Compound Eyes, makes its moves more accurate by 30%, making it a fantastic Sleep Powder user. Combine that with access to other powerful utility moves like Pollen Puff, Tailwind, and super importantly, Rage Powder, and it was a strong option in early Sword and Shield. It would even sometimes be used as a Panic Gigantamax option. A signature move, G-Max Befuddle, would randomly either poison, paralyze, or put to sleep both opponent's Pokémon. Raichu was seen in play throughout competitive Pokémon's history, but strangely, its niche has stayed almost exactly the same. Raichu's ability, Lightning Rod, redirects Electro-type attacks to it, makes it immune to them, and gives it a plus one special attack boost. And Thunder oh. from Kyogre, but the Raichu switch in. Raichu will take that Thunder for Wolf and actually boost its special attack. This lets it protect flying or water type Pokemon like Politoed, Evil Tall, and Kyogre. Along with this ability, Raichu offers its services as a fast fake out user with decent special attack and a smattering of other support moves like Helping Hand and Nuzzle. In 2018, Nido King and Nido Queen were relatively popular special attackers. They both relied on the Sheer Force Life Orb combination to deal devastating damage. Their poison and ground type stab, combined with powerful coverage moves like Ice Beam and Flamethrower, made them great for dealing with a multitude of powerful threats like Tapafini, Salamander, and Ferrothorn. Nido King offered a little more damage and was faster, while Nido Queen was slightly bulkier and slower. Nido King had slightly more results, but Nido Queen had the most impressive one, top cutting worlds in the hands of Brendan Zhang. Clefairy and Clefable have both served as bulky follow me users, forcing their opponents to target them so their partners could do their thing. Generally speaking, Clefairy is better at this role because thanks to its ability Friend Guard, it can mitigate how much damage its partner Pokemon is taking, even if they manage to get hit. Plus, thanks to Eviolite, Clefairy is even bulkier and harder to KO than Clefable. Is. The Fable, on the other hand, has access to Unaware, which makes it ignore stat changes. This means it had a little niche in Scarlet and Violet, because it was good against Dondozo, and it was good when holding an item would be super valuable, like when it wore safety goggles to make it good at redirecting moves like Spore from Amoongus. And of course, before Eviolite existed, it was strictly better than Clefairy. Nine Tails is a pretty simple one. Once it got access to Drought in Generation 5, it became the de facto Sunsetter when Groudon wasn't around. It enabled Pokemon like Harp's Executor in 2012 to get second place at the United Kingdom Nationals, dished out some pretty solid support with moves like Helping Hand, Encore, and Will-O-Wisp, and boosted its own Fire-type attacks. Unfortunately, its stats are pretty mediocre, so it never saw too much consistent play. And with Torkoal, Groudon, and now Coridon around, poor Ninetales is probably going to keep showing up less and less. Parasect only really saw play as an answer to Kyogre. Thanks to its ability Dry Skin, it is immune to Water-type attacks. Combine that with access to Spore, and access to Wide Guard, and he's doing pretty well under that silly blue whale. Golduck saw play in a strategy called Double Duck, a rain team featuring Pelipper, who was apparently a Duck. Gold Duck was the best Swift Swim user, an ability that doubles the Pokemon speed and rain, in the Sun and Moon regional Pokedex. So, it got the chance to shine over other more powerful Swift Swimmers like Ludicolo and Kingdra because they weren't around. Gold Duck would spam fast, rain-boosted water stabs, take advantage of utility moves like Disable and Encore, and sometimes take advantage of the Water-type Z-move. If you've played any VGC, you know how good Arcanine is. Arcanine's great stats, access to powerful stab moves like Flare Blitz, support options like Will-O-Wisp and Snarl, combined with Intimidate, one of the strongest abilities in the game, made sure Arcanine was a staple. Basically, the only time Arcanine isn't good is when there's a strictly better Intimidate option around. So basically, just considerable. Slowbro is, well, slow. 
go figure, and bulky. This has let it serve as a pretty solid Trick Room Pokemon at different points in VGC history, usually packing Trick Room, some utility, and a stab move like Scald. When it had its Mega, it did the same thing, honestly, just, you know, with more stat points. Slowbro's most recent notable success was in 2022, where some Groudon teams used it as an Iron Defense Body Press Pokemon. Gengar is fast, hits hard, and has great utility options like Trick Room and Perish Song. Whenever it's been used, it's been to take advantage of these great traits. When it Mega Evolves, Gengar would gain Shadow Tag, an ability that traps the opposing Pokemon and stops them from switching out, with some exceptions. This meant Gengar was the only Pokemon that both had Shadow Tag and could learn Perish Song, making it an all-in-one Perish Trap. Executor most famously saw play on Wolf Click's 2012 Second Place Worlds team, where it used its ability Harvest, which gives it a 50% chance to regain a berry it's already eaten at the end of each turn. But that becomes guaranteed if the sun is up. Wolf paired Executor with Sunny Day Cresselia to make it into a super survivable Pokemon that can just whittle away at your opponents while it just keeps chomping on its healing berry. Marowak is another one with one specific result I want to talk about, namely in the hands of Mr. Pachiris himself, Sajin Park. Sajin's 2013 Top 8 Worlds team was focused pretty heavily around Pokemon that hate Electro-type attacks, Jellicent and Tornadus, so Marowak's Lightning Rod made it a perfect partner to protect them. Not to mention that with Marowak's low speed and its signature item, Thick Club, which doubles Marowak's Stat, Marowak was a pretty good Trick Room sweeper too. Despite being one of the oldest Pokemon, Weezing only really started to see success in Generation 8. In Generation 8, Weezing was given the ability Neutralizing Gas, which turns off all other abilities on the field, with a few weird exceptions. This allowed Weezing to serve as a piece that could both disrupt your opponent's Pokemon that want their abilities, and enable Pokemon that are usually held back by their abilities, like Regigigas. It has had a smattering of success here and there since then, sometimes enabling silly stuff like Regigigas, and other times just as a good disruptive piece on a team that doesn't really mind if its ability get turned off. It's particularly good with Calyrex Shadow Rider and Ice Rider, because for some reason, Neutralizing Gas doesn't turn off as one. Rhydon is a funny one. Its evolved form, Rhyperior, rather than putting Rhydon in the retirement home, actually helped Rhydon become more valuable, because it gave Rhydon access to Eviolite. With Eviolite, Rhydon is actually way bulkier than Rhyperior, and you were only giving up 10 points in attack to do it. Rhydon has access to Lightning Rod, like Marowak, allowing it to support water types like the Jellicent on the 2013 World's Top 4 team ran by Benjamin Gold. Chansey is a supportive Pokemon, with great HP and Special Bulk, and every supporting move under the sun. Chansey's been used as a fair supportive Pokemon, like on Nick Navarre's 2017 Top 8 NAIC team, where it used Heal Pulse to keep its partners healthy, and used its ability Healer, which gives it a 30% chance to remove status conditions from its partners at the end of each turn. Also a possibility it hits that Chansey. So Gigavolt Havoc, one of the most powerful moves in the game in and the electric terrain. Chansey just shrugs that off. But some players use Chansey in a more sinister way. Chansey's Achilles heel in terms of bulk has always been its exceptionally low physical defense. Enter Shuckle. Shuckle has some of the highest defense and special defense stats in the game, and the move Guard Split, which allows it to pick a target and average out the defenses of the two Pokemon, making Chansey extremely bulky in every stat. But what if we made it worse and made Chansey hard to hit. That's exactly what players did by running Minimize Chansey. This team was gimmicky, but if it worked, it was basically game over. And the team had some results, like top eight of the Taiwan special event in 2018. Mecha Kangaskhan was part of one of the most oppressive cores in VGC history, Chalk. While normal Kangaskhan is a Pokemon that almost no one has ever taken seriously, Mecha Kang goes crazy. Mecha Kangaskhan got the normal 100 extra base stat points that every other Mecha got, but its ability was absolutely positively busted. Parental Bond makes each of your moves hit a second time. At first, that did an extra 50% of the original damage, and then it was nerfed in Generation 7 to do only 25%. People would use this ability to not only deal extra damage, but to abuse moves that had on-hit effects, like flinges from Bite or extra attack boosts from Power Up Punch. Kang was so strong that it won the 2015 World Championships in the hands of Shoma Honami. Magmar and Electabuzz I'm gonna talk about at the same time. Both of these Pokemon got Follow Me, from a move tutor that was only available in the GameCube Pokemon games. Follow Me forces your opponent's Pokemon to target the Follow Me user rather than what they wanted to target. This is extremely strong with Magmar's Flame Body, which gives you a chance to burn when you're hit with a contact move, and like the Buzz of Static, which does the same thing except it'll paralyze you. Recently, they both got back these moves with the Teal Mask DLC after several generations of not having them, but their success was mostly back in the day, with Sage and Park making top 8 of the 2013 World Championships with Magmar. Gyarados is one that has seen a lot of play for a lot of different reasons. Its stats are good, it has access to one of the strongest abilities in the game, Intimidate, and it has a super wide move pool. This has allowed Gyarados to serve as a sweeper with Dragon Dance in some formats, like Sage and Park's 2014 Worlds team, and other times as a supportive Pokemon, with moves like Thunder Wave, Taunt, and Helping Hand, as we've seen on the popular New Balance team back in Regulation C of Scarlet and Violet. Snorlax is bulky, slow, and he hits hard. The end.
No, for real. Snorlax is a weirdly large selection of traits that makes it pretty powerful. It came in fourth place at the 2010 World Championships, and then, during late 2016, all the way through the rest of Sun and Moon, its popularity exploded. In Generation 7, berries that healed you when you hit 25% of your HP, also called Pinch Berries, healed you for 33% of your maximum HP. Players took advantage of this great healing with Snorlax's ability, Gluttony, which allowed Snorlax to eat his snack at 50% of his HP instead of saving it for later. This made Snorlax a great Pokemon to abuse Belly Drum, which maxes out your attack stat at the cost of 50% of your maximum HP, allowing Snorlax to completely sweep the game. With Gluttony and a Pinch Berry, Snorlax would end up extremely healthy even after a Belly Drum. And with the move Recycle, Snorlax could get its Healing Berry back over and over again. This was often paired with Trick Room and Mimikyu to create what people called Mimilax. Snorlax continued to be strong on a variety of strategies in the Sun and Moon era, and since then has still had some fringe success in Sword and Shield, including a top four in the hands of Alex Gomez the 2020 Mammal Regional Championships, and a little more fringe success in online tournaments during Scarlet and Violet. Articuno was for a long time and awful Pokemon. Its stats wanted it to be defensive, but with some of the worst defensive typing in the game and ice and flying, it was really difficult to pull off. And then, Scarlet and Violet happened, with the advent of the terrestrialization phenomenon and the change of ice types weather, from hail to snow, giving ice types a 1.5 5 boost to defense while it's up, things changed drastically overnight, actually allowing Articuno to take advantage of its natural defenses and letting it win its first ever regional championship. Zapdos is by far the strongest of the three legendary birds. Electric and flying is great defensive typing, because with flying giving you an immunity to ground, there is literally no downside to the electric type. It just gives you extra resists. Zapdos has been a consistently powerful, bulky special attacker, sometimes with supporting moves like Tailwind, spamming Max Airstream during Sword and Shield, etc. The combination of traits that Zapdos has has allowed it to see success in close to every format it's been legal in all the way back since 2010. Thanks to Articuno's buff, this generation Moltres is by far the least powerful of the three birds, but I did find that it had some success, top baiting the 2014 Italian Nationals and coming in fourth place at the 2018 Latin American International Championships in the hands of Paul Ruiz as an answer to Geomancy's Ernius by roaring the boosted deer off the field. Second to last, we have Dragonite. It saw a smattering of play throughout the years thanks to its access to powerful moves like Extreme Speed, Tailwind, and Dragon Dance, but it wasn't until Scarlet and Violet where it went absolutely nuts. With the advent of Terrestrialization, Inner Focus's buff from Generation 8, which made it ignore Intimidate, suddenly Choice Band, Terra normal Extreme Speed Dragonite became an absurdly powerful threat that could knock out almost anything that didn't resist it. And finally, we have what some consider to be the best Pokemon ever. Mewtwo. Mewtwo has some pretty strong stats and a lot of coverage, but not too much utility it can offer. It's really only a special attacker. It saw a little bit of fringe play in 2016 with its Mega, and in 2019 with Tapu Lele, and it even top aided Worlds way back in 2010, but honestly, he kinda sucks. Well, there you have it. Every Kanto Pokemon that I thought was worth talking about. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks. Bye.